Welcome back to the Wine Tech Insiders podcast. Here we are again, joined to talk about the tech news and tech topics of the day. The wine tech topics of the day are Nick from Wine Owners, Jonathan from Bottle Books. Hello. And of course, Lori from Outshinery. <laughs> Hi. And um, we want to dive into a bunch of news that's, that's going on in the wine world as we do um, every couple of weeks. Um, big news um, uh, follows a bunch of other uh, news that we've heard uh, at the start of this year. Um, similar news that um, Vin Italy has now officially canceled uh, their event. Um, this comes uh, a few months after uh, Povine officially canceled. This is the second year um, in a row uh, due to COVID that these events are unable to go on these big uh, fairs. Um, I guess, what is the reaction? Was this expected? Did, did you think that, that things would find out, they would find a way to do it? Maybe Jonathan, you're right at the forefront of this wine event. What do you think about this news? Yeah, we've been on really a roller coaster the last the last few weeks. Um, I mean, it, going back to December, um, I was a very strong believer in the London Wine Fair being able to have a physical um, a physical event. That obviously changed in January when the venue was closed for the entire summer, um, and they moved very quickly to go to an all digital solution, um, leveraging the work they'd already done on the hybrid. Um, so. Um, yeah, I think that the last few weeks in particular then have shown that there's still unfortunately a bit of road to travel still to get uh, COVID in the rear view mirror, um, so to speak. So I would say it's it's um, um, not unsurprising, um, but um, an, an all out cancellation is, is a pretty significant is a pretty significant decision to make. What do you think, Nick? Are these um, fairs going to be damaged by this? Are they, will they be able to come back? Do, do you have any feel? I think they will. Um, I mean, I think there was no choice in doing what has happened. You know, clearly uh, there are different speeds at which the populations of different countries are getting vaccinated. There are different levels of uncertainty around that happening and over what period of time that's going to happen. So... Um, I think it is the only decision that could be made. I think, you know, if you go back um, 20 years, uh, as I'm able to do, to um, the year 2000 or, or that kind of period, and you, you um, reflect on the conversations that were taking place back then in respect of the future of exhibitions and events and whether the internet was going to do for them or whether um, unlike um, tr traditional media like publishing, whether they were, whether they, whether they were going to show resilience because of the fundamental desire of people of buyers and sellers to come together at a meeting place. And, and I suspect that that desire will continue a long under long after covid i think the last 20 years has very clearly demonstrated that digi digitization has not affected um uh, the um exhibition business um and it's thrived i'm really excited to see how these digital events take shape and how particularly in a market that is very experiential like wine um, that digital experience is going to feel to both exhibitors and visitors. Um, so it may well be that there will be an evolution as a result of this forced um, situation um, where there will be more of a blend between the digital and the physical in the future. I think that's a very real scenario. Um, and I look forward to figuring out what that looks and feels like. Um, but I'm absolutely certain that the future of these events is simply on pause and is by no means finished. Laurie, there's a, there was a similar report um, by CG and Zonal um, that, that surveyed 18 to 24 year olds and more than half of them 
still uh, would prefer to order online, even if everybody's vaccinated in the country. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mean, that's on the consumer level. We were talking about the trade. What, which is, what do you think in general? Is, are we going to go back to the way it was? Is it going to be a hybrid, as Nick said? Where do you think everything is going to go? I think, you know, what happened um, to the industry and to the world at large showcased that there is efficiencies to be gained and that there was a lot of um, wasted time and resources like for just busyness. And uh, for example, in the world of our channel, we do bottled images without the need of shipping samples, like actual product samples. And even if you can go back, you know, to your warehouse, arrange for UPS and, you know, like doing like the whole thing um, just for a like, one-off and take your time off your day in your home office. Uh, why would you do that when you can like, you know, do it all like one at the same time, like reheating your lunch, you know, like at the same time and doing laundry. Um, like I think it's just like some of the things that have been always mentioned, like, oh, like we've always done it that way because we weren't almost like creative enough to think there may be a better way. I think COVID really accelerated that um, when it comes to the trade and like to like wineries and suppliers. So I'm really excited about this, not just because it benefits, um, you know, my company, but also because hopefully, you know, when this is more behind us, it would free some time and resources to actually um, create this hybrid experience, spend more time, like, <clears throat> excuse me, creating something that is unique to um, each wine brand and, and taking like having the mental resources uh, and creativity for that um, because some of the busy work has just been you know taken care of finally <laughs> jonathan if we go forward a year what is what is one of the things that i mean you're working with with all a lot of these events and doing dig, fully digital events but what's what's one thing that you think will will last in a hybrid world um i think that uh, I think that content will um, thrive and bring people together online. Um, I think that's the, the anecdotes have become more than anecdotes that the engagement and the, uh, for the online events have been significantly higher than the physical events. Um, in the last year, the no shows for the people that were showing up to physical trade shows um, had really accelerated um, and uh, you might have 40% no-shows for your physical event, um, whereas online you end up with triple the registrations and, low, and lower no-shows on top of that. Um, and so I think for the organizers who are putting together um, great content, it's really been quite an, uh, quite an exciting ride and opens up some possibilities for the future. I, I completely agree with what Nick says that I think the, the wine industry will be very resilient and, and, and want to get back uh, together. Um, uh, but it's the the the, uh, the Swiss Army knife, so to speak. It's it's going to have more than two blades in it in the future. There's going to be, you know, also a, a screwdriver and you know a, a fancy toothpick and all sorts of all sorts of gadgets in that people can use to grow their business. Um, but I think I think content is something that um, uh, that will keep bringing people back together. Well, in terms of gadgets, if you have if you have one hundred and seventy nine um, thousand uh, dollars, you can now get Wine Cab, which is a seven axis industrial high speed robotic arm wine cellar that will automatically scan your uh, <laughs> your bottles. <laughs> is, are we ready? This oh, you can get. Is, this, is this just for the billionaires? <laughs> Yeah. This was uh, this was released. Uh, this was announced a few days ago that that they're doing this for some high end uh, 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 restaurants. Is this is this the kind of tech that that is really uh, w w what's the kind of tech that will last um, going forward? Nick, I don't know if you have a thought. Sorry. Um, so consumer tech in the home around wine collecting and and consuming um well i mean i think 
I, I think it's relatively well established, but I think that, uh, you know, Corovin has certainly showed the way, haven't they, in terms of how you can be a lot more flexible in your appreciation of your wine collection. And, um, and of course, um, software has sort of adapted to the idea of fractions rather than bottles, which is fun. Um, I think that there is a massive dis sort of discrepancy between the the drivers and expectations of collectors in the US market and elsewhere. So in the US market, people want to know what is in their cellar down to the hole in the rack. Yeah. <laughs> and other people think that's insane. <laughs> so it just depends on how you approach it, right? And, and there, is, there really is massive differences in attitudes and um, an, an approach to how collections are managed uh, across different countries. Um, and, um, you know, the key as always is, um, is um, stuff that's flexible enough to satisfy people's desires. Um, uh, if not their unrealistic demands, and um, if they want a robotic arm in their cellar, um, then good luck to them. I guess as long as they keep it out of the bedroom, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laurie, we also wanted to talk about um, today about um, introducing tech to your customers. And I think we've kind of, uh, the moment that we're in, um, uh, COVID has forced a lot of people um, to to um, to to adopt to force to them to face tech or to use tech um, in their mm -hmm. daily lives and in their business, um, but maybe we could just talk uh, open this topic a little bit um, and talk about it. What what's so scary about tech to people in general? What, why does it sometimes take a, a massive pandemic to push people towards tech? Oh man, that's, that's, that's a heavy question. Um, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I have like the, the full answer on this. I think it's, um, okay, let, let me think this one through. Like, I think it's just like the, the level of like learning and adaptation. I think um, there is like more unknown, like it's always, uh, you know, more convenient mentally to just do things that we know we're really good at doing already and do more of it. And I think technology, it feels like it's almost, and it's true, like I feel that my, myself too, like it's, it's a never ending race, right? Like technology, like never, like never stop. There's always like a software update, like a new features. Um, and I think sometimes it feels, it can feel a bit like a, like a losing battle. So like why, why even like go there and rather like, you know what, like my, not necessarily like my pen and paper, like I know why there is, you know, beyond that, but exist, I can rely, trust, and I know how it works. And it was like this 10 years ago and I can go back. Um, so I, I can see like this kind of like almost like comfort and confidence and how I'm doing it right now without tech is still really nice. Like, but then, or I think like it's doing a good job, but then move to the pandemic and things that just can't be, you know, like that, um, like manual and that, um, you know, not in the cloud. And I think it's just, that's what like, it's gonna like show the world a bit of like of possibilities. And I think for me, like that's one of the most exciting part when we bring tech um, to wineries around the world is just kind of like, obviously we can't see them when we're not on Zoom, but I can imagine a bit like the sparkle in their eyes because suddenly you kind of like open the world of possibility. Um, wineries get more creative with like their marketing campaign or how they can present their brand and it just, like a renewed um, like spark, if you will, like for like their wine brand and just because tech enabled it. And and hopefully, you know, like what we're seeing is like, there is no going back. Like even wineries, new wineries, what we're seeing here at Ochaneries that started with us like early pandemic, um, like they have been, you know, staying with us, like still, you know, we're still in the pandemic, but like they show no sign of like stopping and all, like when we talk to them, like it doesn't look like they will ever go back even uh, afterwards. So it's just, it's kind of like initial uh, adoption. Yeah. Nick, Wine Owners has fairly recently just released like a, a new suite of tools and and how, how were you introducing that to to customers, to, to new customers? How are you getting them into this new tech? 
So we were, you know, so the tech, the hub, uh, is very focused on uh, retailers, merchants, and and importers, and and really we were focused on on three challenges. Um, not necessarily all the same challenges that everyone experiences, but three very clear issues that businesses have faced for you know a very long time in one form or another. The first is starting up, and we are in a long tail market. We are in a market where knowledge relationships with customers are key and therefore the cost of 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 starting up is 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 relatively low the barriers to entry are certainly relatively low so challenge one is how do you start up effectively and and increase significantly your chances of success because as we all know there's a failure rate around startups the second is around uh, being more efficient and and really begging the question, how well organized are you? How much time are you spending on the things that aren't particularly productive as a consequence of, uh, of um, lack of technology, lack of systemization? Uh, and and what, is the, what, what could the impact on your business be if all of those things that collectively take quite so much time for you to do manually and increase the probability of mistakes being made mm -hmm. um, were, you know, if you can address all of that, how much, how much time do you buy back in order to um, grow your business? And then, and then leading into that, the third theme is really around business growth. Everybody wants to grow their business. Everyone knows if they don't grow their business, they're, relatively speaking to the rest of the market going to be going backwards and and i think honestly up to, up to now the inhibitors of people adopting technology has been fear of failure i think people have seen historically so many of those sorts of projects go very badly wrong and 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 um, and drain the and, and drain the business um, so um, you know, a part of the opportunity is being able to demonstrate that with the, the new um, technologies that aren't just about automating your business, but are also about the factors that take the brakes off your business and help you to grow, such as being much more efficient in how you connect up with your sources of supply, being able to think in terms of multiple sales and marketing channels and managing those without fear of tripping over or overselling or any of those things that people, people have experienced in the past, right? When people have tried to do that sort of thing manually or in a semi-automated fashion, the chances of getting it wrong of making a mistake are very high. So, so I think, you know, the, the opportunity now, particularly in the world in which we're gradually, hopefully, easing out of, is that it's, it's shown very clearly who the winners and the losers are. And now that there are platforms like the Hub that are very accessible, very easy to adopt without spending a lot of money and which are de-risked because they are industry specific in the first place and they're proven to work well then i think we're going to see far more people um, um, making that leap uh, if there are proof points that help them to see uh, and prove that um the level of, of, of risk and the degree of upside um, are, you know, are, are significantly uh, improved compared to perhaps, you know, previous experience that people would have, would have felt. Jonathan, you're, you're bringing tech, well, you're connecting large retailers uh, specialty importers, national associations, and small mom and pop farmers um, through this rich product data. Is there, are these completely different groups to deal with 
in the tech world uh, when you're introducing them to tech, or are there are there similarities among these these variant groups um, uh, in terms of uh, their their fear of tech and and introducing them to new things? Um, that's an interesting question. I I think the um, in many ways when it comes to working with our partners and collecting um, wine information, their perspectives are all relatively um, similar. Um, they know they need the information. They know that they've had a process where they've gotten the information before. Um, but I think past experience has always made them a bit nervous about what their partners think or what their suppliers think or what their members think. Um, and they may have experienced uh, situations in the past where they tried, they tried to roll out something technically advanced to their association or to their suppliers, and it didn't go particularly well. Um, we helped um, one association last year set up um, meeting booking links uh, using Calendly, like you see more and more often. Um, and we thought it was kind of a no-brainer, and um, the association was excited about it. Uh, but then we ended up spending an, uh, basically an hour per winemaker on the phone, walking them through how to set up a Calendly link. And so that was even quite humbling for us um, in the process. And I think, um, so I think the, the um, you know, the, the caution that people have is, is, not, is not unfounded. Um, but that said, as we've been talking about, uh, COVID has changed a lot. Um, and people have had to try things out and become more comfortable with tech. Um, and it's, it's not, and it's going so quickly that if you're not doing, doing this every day, you might not really see how quick that the, the winemakers are accelerating in their acceptance of tech and the, and the level of comfort with it um, because they're signing up for digital events. Signing up for digital events means you've gone through an entire registration process. You've probably shipped your wines off for rebottling. And then you've gone through the matchmaking and meeting booking and video conferencing. And because wineries are not sitting around waiting for the world to come to them, they are out there pushing their business um, and, 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 um, and, and keeping their business going and growing during, during COVID. And so I think things have really accelerated. And I think as we mentioned on the, one of the first podcasts this year, um, the, you could say the only, only benefit of having COVID last longer is that people are, are, are going to, these learnings are going to turn into habits and they're going to stick better, um, afterwards. And, um, and, um, and so that level of comfort, it's, it's growing. Um, but it's, you know, there, there is this history of, of experiences of the past that, um, you know, still leave um, some businesses trigger shy. Laurie, what about that stickiness? How, how, how do you then have that, those tech ideas stick with the customer? I think it's all about making it easy and a no brainer. I think you demonstrate like the value. It's almost like, you know, be great on the first date, <laughs> you know, like just like having this, like blow like um like the people's expectation and like do like the first part really well and then uh, making sure that you are right away thinking about the continuation of this partnership like often even when i talk to my team is um like the metaphor i use is uh, you know let's be the robin to their batman you know like we want to be the sidekick like for the long term um so for example a couple of things that we do uh at our channel is we take care of like your vintage updates uh, for you. Like it's free, like we take care of you. We know you're gonna encounter this problem. We right away um, like acknowledge it, take care of it. Um, and we even going so far, like if your rose date changes color, for example, year over year, we will also adjust so that you have a perfect product representation and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like we're taking care of that for you. Again, all online, no samples needed. We kind of anticipate also that, oh, you may need lifestyle images, like marketing doesn't stop at bottle shots. Um, that would be too easy, uh, you know? So it's just like, uh, we like we kind of offer like solutions um, that is more like for the long-term and we meet wineries where they are. Some wineries, 
uh, they right away see the potential and they also probably have more budget or they will go right away bottle shot, lifestyle images, product video, like they all do that in one big swoop. Other wineries, it's really interesting to know like they just maybe for two years in a row, they just do the bottle shot with us. They're really happy to get like a good hang, you know, of how things work. And then suddenly like they come to us and say, hey, you know what, we're ready to do like recipe cards. Like we're very excited. We know that you offer that now, like wine pairing and recipes. Let's do it. And it's just like very interesting to to build this relationship. And that's something that um, I think technology sometime, um, you know, I'm not saying these people in the panel here, but like it just overall, like it's almost like it's all about like getting people in and then not like taking care of them and anticipating, anticipating their needs and being really aware of that. I still think our channel has even more work to be done on that, uh, you know, on that matter and we're working on it. Um, but it's been really interesting that way to just anticipate their need and answer that question, hopefully mm -hmm. even before they arise. Nick, uh, have you already started thinking about this with the hub? For sure. So kind of, you know, back to your earlier question, hopefully the earlier answer demonstrated that we really talk about the business and the ways in which they're looking to improve how they operate their business, how they get um, more customers, how they increase market share. And, and that really is a reflection of how we present technology to, to, to them. All of the other stuff in terms of, can it do this? Can it do that? Is it industry specific? It's, you know, that's, that's those are a bunch of givens. Um, so when people are signing up for technology, they're signing up for something that's going to help them be better tomorrow than they are today. But they also, I think, are really mindful increasingly of the roadmap into the future and having a clear sense of whether th that you are going to be able to take them on that road, whether you're going to be able to, in some way, or in some ways, lead their thinking. Um, and I think, to that end, people need to know that they're signing up to a service or a platform that is that is open. And, and I think if you look at a lot of technology platforms that grew up over the last 10 or 20 years, they do quite like to kind of wrap their arms around a customer and propose that they can do absolutely everything for them, that they don't need to connect up to any other external service and probably are quite discouraging of it. And I just don't think that feels right or at all comfortable anymore. So I think, I think that is an absolute key attribute of a successful technology business of a successful technology um, ethos and roadmap on on both on both the supplier side and uh, and of course you know the um, um, the 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 operator of, of the technologies um, side as well. So I think super, could not agree more, Laura. I think it is so fundamental um, to be able to 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 demonstrate that there are a variety of ways in which a business can evolve and the and and that the platform will be able to support them in how they wish to develop their business forward because technology in itself is no de facto competitive advantage it is how businesses use that technology and how they make choices in respect of their strategy uh, that the, and, and, and how technology supports that that gives that that is that, that differentiates business that gives them their uh, their, their competitive advantage Jonathan do you want a last word on what uh, Laurie and Nick were saying yeah I mean I think you know 10 years ago technology was just a bit simpler um, although we also said that at that time, 10 years earlier, it was a lot simpler. Um, and it just wasn't doing nearly as much. And so you could maybe then envision, you know, one company providing most of your core, um, core systems. And nowadays, 
um, the the level of automation and detail and, and knowledge that goes into each of these systems, I think that um, uh, makes it increasingly difficult to be able to find one vendor that can provide all of these to the same quality as, um, as several specialists who have done smart integrations with each other. Um, and um, and, and the, um, even from running a business or growing a business, uh, certainly you, when you lean too far out of the window, you lose focus and the customers that, you know, that, that came to you for a certain reason, um, you know, you have, you run the risk of alienating them. So I think it's, you know, the, especially in wine tech, um, it is, it is a very detail oriented business, um, and keeping focus on what you do best and then, uh, finding partners who do their part amazingly well and, going out and doing a solution together. I think that's, um, I think that's also what brings us, especially on this call, I think that brings us all together in, in that, in that belief. Well, that's a great final note. Thank you again, our wine tech insiders, Lori from Outshinery, Jonathan thank you, thank from Bottle and <laughs> Nick from Wine Owners. We'll see you again in a few weeks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.